She is our preferred professional partner, Linda Yonke, who is a board certified patient advocate who will be leading this seminar today. Linda has been a long-term care insurance specialist for over 30 years now. After graduating from the University of Iowa, she began her career working in a skilled nursing facility, which provided care for residents suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Seeing the need to plan for care expenses, Linda quickly built a career as an insurance broker. In October 2013, Linda founded Yonke Consulting and Long-Term Care Alliance. The mission of Yonke Consulting is to provide premier long-term care insurance options and claims advocacy. Linda and her team manage and oversee all aspects of a claim event, as well as manage professional care options. Through this critical service, Linda Yonke uh, with Yonke Consulting has filed hundreds of long-term in care insurance claims successfully. Linda has contributed to the San Diego care community through her tenure as a board member with the George G. Klenner Alzheimer Family Care Centers and the Area Agency on Aging. As I said, she is a board certified patient advocate and she enjoys speaking to professionals and families about the value of early planning for future care needs. Let's all welcome now, Linda Yonke. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, well, hello everybody. It's so nice to see you all on this wonderful March, beautiful March day. I do wanna share just a teeny bit about, um, as Suzanne gave the bio introduction, this is my 35th year in the long-term care insurance arena. Um, because we do claims advocacy, I do probably look at the product, the long-term care product, maybe a little bit differently than other people, mainly because we get our hands really dirty on the claims side of it, so to speak. And so I have a good understanding of how these things, how people actually use their policies, policy usage and those types of things. So we're just gonna jump right in. The one thing that I want to communicate most today is to try and um, counterbalance what I believe is a lot of misunderstanding about long-term care in general, and which contributes to why some people don't plan. The other thing I want to share is that long-term care insurance is just a tool. It's not something that everybody should buy. And I hope with this type of a program that it will give people listening and understanding of, you know, that's something that I probably should do or no, I don't think that's something that based on my financial and my family situation that I need to pursue. And that's what we want to do is to educate people and help them take this off their plate. The reason I say that is because all the time when an individual and I are talking about this, often they'll say to me, I, this has been on my mind. I was going to buy it 10 years ago and I decided not to. And I just find that it's often something that people continue to wonder about. And so I hope that I can help move that process along from you in either direction. The one thing that I do want to talk about this afternoon is just how care is changing so much. You all know this, especially if you have friends or elderly parents that you have experienced any kind of a care event with. Obviously this can happen to anybody, even people who are younger, this can happen to. However, our focus is on the 34 million family members and friends that are actually providing care to their family members. One of the things that I hear often is people say, this is such a huge problem. I just don't know how people can do it. And so the government is going to have to step in. And one of the things that I point out to them and say, well, the federal government and the state does pay for certain type of long-term care. And I'm gonna explain that in a moment, but I want you to take a look at this number right down here where my cursor is. The estimated suggested amount of money that is spent for informal care costs from family members and friends is 277 
$1.5 billion, and that was in 2011. This is from the Journal of American Geriatric Society, dated 2018. Now, why that number is important is because when we talk about long-term care, a lot of people automatically think nursing home. And what I want to do is to say, no, no, this number represents people that are helping out parents, loved ones, family members in all kinds of different ways, because for whatever reason, these folks really need some support in their home because of their medical condition or their cognitive function. This is a hidden issue in the community. You live in your neighborhood, and I would imagine that you'd be shocked to know how many people in your neighborhood actually are either homebound and you don't even know it, or are family members that are spending their extra hours looking after a family member and you don't know that either. Um, there's a lot of money that's not paid, invested in informal home care. 80% of all long-term care is still provided by family members and friends. Um, institutionalized care, such as care in a nursing home and care in assisted living facilities is actually decreasing. In fact, I was speaking with one of um, a preferred assisted living facility um, nurse yesterday about one of our clients. And she said, Linda, we literally cannot fill our census up. Just three years ago, she said, we had a waiting list before COVID, we had a waiting list of people that wanted to get into our community. And now we can't get people to come and even tour. Um, and facility care was declining even before COVID, but now it's even going farther down. And I asked her, I'm like, well, where are these people going? And she said that people are literally quitting their jobs, the folks that they talk to, to bring their parents in and take care of them. Just a little personal side story about myself. In January, my mom had both of her knees replaced. And for any of you who have gone through that procedure, you know it's it's touted as one of the worst procedures you can have done. And I can testify that my poor mom, it was just horrific. Anyway, my mom is not quite 80 yet, but as a result of this, um, we had a conversation about my mom and my dad moving from Iowa to come to California to live with my husband and I. And so our decision to do that and their decision to come in and live with us is what many multiple millions of people decide every year because they're looking at what might be coming down the road and they wanna make sure that they can handle. I wanna be sure I can be there for my parents. Now, what is long-term care? Um, so long-term care can be a, a multiple of things, but when we talk about long-term care insurance, in general, we're talking about an individual who, for whatever reason, physical problems, cognitive problems, they need assistance with their activities of daily living, or they need supervision because they have a cognitive problem. So when I say assistance with activities of daily living, this is what I mean. An individual who is getting quite elderly and maybe not walking like they used to, or maybe having a difficult time getting up out of a chair, um, or maybe they've had a slip in the bathroom and they're a little afraid to get in and out of the shower so they're not showering as much as they used to. Well, that individual probably doesn't need somebody to physically help them, but they sure could be assisted by a shower chair, a handheld shower um, faucet, and somebody standing by in the event that they run into a spot and they need some help. That type of a person, we see that all the time. And a lot of times people are at that place and they don't even recognize that they're doing something that's a little bit more dangerous. They probably shouldn't be getting in and out of the tub. People still have very old bathrooms that they have not remodeled. And a lot of people step up over tubs, get into a shower. It's just dangerous. The other thing is dressing, toileting, transferring, ambulating, or getting food in and out of the mouth. So let me give you an example for dressing. This is a, a, another one, like I'll just use my mom as an example. And I always tell her I'm talking about her so she doesn't mind. Um, my mom's supposed to be wearing these special hose, TED hose. Well, if any of you have ever tried to put those things on, they're really difficult to get on and off. And so an individual who has difficulty bending over, putting them over their feet, will not wear them because they're just a hassle um, and they can't get them up. And so someone like that would benefit by an individual coming in just every day, just real quick, helping them with their stockings, their Ted hose, 
helping them with their other art articles of clothing and that's it. So they don't necessarily need somebody to physically put all of their clothing on. These individuals I'm talking about are not bedridden. These individuals do not need to be in a nursing home and a lot of times don't even need to be in assisted living. They just need a little bit of what's called scheduled support. Scheduled meaning I can schedule a support person, either my family or a home care agency, agency to come in at particular time throughout the week to help me to make sure that I'm safe during my bathing schedule or my showering schedule to get my dressing on to help me with my shoes and socks to drive me or to take me to the doctor, get my medications, get some extra groceries, those types of things. Um, that's the primary person that we see oftentimes who's needing to file a claim. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of activities of daily living. And folks, this type of thing happens very slowly, generally, unless somebody has an, um, an accident. But typically how this happens is that people slowly start losing the ability and they start accommodating themselves in dealing with their functional skills either hiding it from their family members or doing it in a way that's a little bit dangerous. Instrumental activities of daily living, I mentioned those just a little bit ago. Long-term care insurance does cover this as well. And that's the type of thing that we all do for our loved ones. Um, making sure their medication is put in their little boxes properly, making sure their, their groceries are stocked and that their food is not spoiled in the refrigerator, getting them to appointments, um, I know for myself, even just driving around San Diego, I'm feeling nervous about it and I have to drive all the time, but transportation is a huge problem for folks that are feeling a little bit insecure about getting in the car and getting on the freeways. And so individuals benefit greatly from having an agency, a support person come and take them out on the road so that they don't have to get into their car. Who provides long-term care? The majority of long-term care is in the home. Uh, most of the claims that we file are for home care claims. And I think statistically, 70% of all claims are filed first start on the home. In general, what we see is an individual following what's called the care continuum and that they start off by having a family member help them a little bit like a spouse or a daughter. And then they, uh, move on to maybe hiring somebody to do a little bit extra to give their family members a respite or a break. And then sometimes they move on to a higher level of care, which would be like assisted living or dementia memory care. And then the very tail end, sometimes people do go into nursing facilities. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But in home care right now, I just want to camp out on that for a little bit. As I said, most of our clients file claims and use their policies here. Well, we're going to talk a little bit in a moment about how much that costs, but what does that look like? So home care agency, they would be able to do all types of different things, but the majority of the care is to provide functional safety so that their client can age in their home safely and to prevent falls and traumatic events like a head injury or something like that. In San Diego, I don't remember the exact number of home care agencies. It's changed since COVID, but there were over 400 that people could choose from. Adult daycare centers, you may not be familiar with that, but one of the most um, prominent ones here in San Diego is an organization called the George G. Glenner Alzheimer's Family Care Center. They are communities that cater to individuals that have cognitive impairments and their families can take them and stay they can stay in programming at these communities for up to eight hours a day. Adult daycare centers are lifesavers for adult kids that are caring for an individual that has a cognitive impairment. Um, lifesavers because that means that the family can work while the individual is at their community. They get a meal, there's nursing staff there, etc. And adult daycare is very inexpensive, very, very inexpensive. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Continuing care retirement communities are these places like um, in La Jolla, like the V, for example, or in Rancho Bernardo, um, the Casa de las Campanas, um, La Costa Glen also is another continuing care. These are communities that you have to pay kind of like a 
an endowment fee, an upfront fee to get in and it buys down your care. Uh, residential care facilities are also called boarding care facilities. They're also called assisted living care facilities. And those are communities that provide support to individuals on a non-medical basis. Now, they do have medical people, but for the most part, these individuals that live in these communities um, can be cared for in a non-medical fashion, although they do have medical problems. Then the last thing is a skilled nursing facility, and you know what those are. Those are a very high acuity. Uh, skilled nursing facilities are places where most rehab uh, do take place these days. So like my mom, when she had her knees replaced, she went to a skilled nursing facility. And um, they provide, uh, Medicare usually pays, and I'm gonna explain that again. Now, what I do wanna say about skilled nursing facilities uh, is that in all of the years that I've been in this business, uh, I can probably count maybe on hand, two hands and maybe my two toes, my two feet, the amount, the number of clients that have gone into skilled nursing facilities. It generally doesn't happen. If you have private funds to stay out of them, and I'll um, address that again as we go farther. So the point of saying that is when you think about long-term care planning, I really don't want you to think about the dreaded nursing home event because that's likely not to happen. Maybe short-term, but if so, Medicare should pay for that for you. Now, I'm gonna talk about Medicare a little bit. And if you're not of Medicare age, then I just want you in your mind to put in your, the name of your health insurance. So I have Sharp Healthcare. Um, so health insurance and Medicare, this is how and, and what they pay for in home care. And this is one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is because there's a lot of misunderstanding. And the reason why is this, a lot of times um, care professionals will say, if you're going to be having a procedure, oh, don't worry, we'll order home health care for you. And the same is true about hospice. They'll, they'll say, if you need home health care, your doctor will order that for you and Medicare will pay. And that is true. But the difference is this, Medicare that pays for home care is called home health. And it is a high level of service. It is a skilled level such as registered nurse for wound dressing, or if there's some type of an injury that a nurse needs to make sure that the wound is healing uh, or phys uh, speech therapy for someone who's had a stroke and they need some swallowing therapy, uh, physical therapy for sure, and occupational therapy. So those therapies are paid for by Medicare, but it's limited. It's limited in how long they're going to allow you to have that service in your home. And it's not custodial in nature. So what I mean by that is this. Let's say that you have a hip replacement and you say, I don't want to go to a facility because I'm afraid of COVID. I'm going to go right home. And the doctor releases you from the hospital right directly home. And you're thinking in your mind, but that's okay because I'm going to get home care. Well, the home care agency is going to come out maybe a couple days later. You're going to be on your own unless you've got somebody at home with you. You're going to be on your own to get yourself to the bathroom, to get yourself out of bed, et cetera, et cetera. I'm painting the picture of what happens. That home health care agency is going to come in and do an assessment for your physical therapy. They're going to be with you for an hour max. They may do help with assist bathing and they're out the door and you're on your own for the rest of the time. It is not custodial. Hospice is the same way. So when an individual goes on hospice, that usually means that they've got some pretty high medical needs that need to be attended to. Um, but hospice organizations will come in a couple times a week uh, with their nurses and, um, and in an emergency, they certainly will. But on all the other hours that you're there, you have to have somebody with you to help you with your activities of daily living. And Medicare does not provide that service. And that's out of pocket. You have to pay for that yourself. The same is true in a skilled nursing facility. Just quick story. Uh, my grandfather uh, worked for John Deere in the Midwest his whole life. And my family always touted that we had the best health insurance. My grandfather had the best health insurance because John Deere was amazing. They never had to pay a penny out of pocket. 
so they never really thought, <clears throat> excuse me, and my family never considered if something happened to my grandfather that John Deere insurance and Medicare wouldn't pay because they always had paid. You might be the same if you have Kaiser or Sharp or United Healthcare. They do such a great job for medical care. So my grandfather had a stroke and unfortunately he had such a severe stroke that he wasn't able to recover and his Medicare only paid 10 days when he went into the skilled nursing facility. And as it happens, once Medicare stops paying for a service, your secondary, your health insurance, your Medicare supplement, your HMO will not pay either. So regardless of how wonderful your health insurance is, your primary payer most likely will be Medicare. And if Medicare does not pay, you're not getting a penny from your secondary either. Well, why in the world would Medicare not pay in a skilled nursing facility if you're in such a condition that you need to be in that nursing home? Here's why. The first thing is there are rules. Medicare will pay in a skilled nursing facility if you're admitted to a nursing home from a hospital stay of at least three days. Well, you already know what the problem is with that right now is staying in a hospital for three days is not easy. Um, but that's the first rule. Three days in the hospital, fourth day discharge. The second thing is it has to be rehabilitative in nature in order for Medicare to pay. So what that means is that the person's condition has to be such that at the admission and at their regular interval checks, this person, it appears as though there is a real rehabilitative process going on and potential. Once an individual like my grandfather gets to a point where they peak out in their therapy and they just simply are not going to be recovered, Medicare will not approve that stay anymore and the person has a choice. They can start paying privately in that skilled nursing facility if there's, if there's a place where they can stay there or they have to leave. Um, people can get a little bit more of an extension, but in general, for most people, Medicare pays 22.5 days. Even though, like I said, if you look at your Medicare outline of coverage, it will show 100 days, all health insurance, we will pay up to 100 days. And the fine print says, unless, and so this is the unless, if you're not getting rehab, if you didn't come from a hospital, and if you're not getting better, you're not gonna be paid for by Medicare. Medicare does not pay one day in residential care or memory care facilities, boarding care, none of that stuff is paid for by Medicare at all. It's all private pay. So let's talk about the cost. Right now, I had to revise these because even just um, before COVID, these numbers, honestly, just two years ago, we were at about 50,000 a year for home care. COVID has changed a lot. As you all know, we're still remote on most of our things, but what has changed in the care industry is home care agencies are all increasing their fees. Um, the low side right now, I, I honestly don't think we can find a home care agency that will um, provide services for under $25 an hour. That's just unheard of. Now you can have an independent or private caregiver do that. But most agencies are charging right now between $28 to $42 an hour. And that's for custodial care. Again, that's not skilled care. If you actually need a nurse that Medicare is not going to be paying for, um, and you have to pay out of pocket, which is kind of rare to have a nurse. Generally, people don't need nurses caring for them in their home. But let's say you do for something, you're looking at $180 an hour minimum. So right now, the average cost for a person who's on care in their home getting about four to six hours of care a day, okay, that's it, four to six hours of care, they're going to be paying about $73,000 a year for that care. Now, long-term care insurance, most people today will buy a benefit of about $5,000 a month. And so if you had $5,000 a month coming in, that's about 60 grand a year. That would definitely offset this number for sure. But look at this in 2046. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's important that we do these presentations for people that are even in their late 40s and early 50s, because planning for this is so critically important. Um, again, 
the issue of long-term care is not going away because we're either going to die or we're going to become disabled before we die, right? right. We're going to fall into one of two categories. Um, and so I pushed this out 30 years, as you can see. And again, this is probably a low estimate, but this is what you're looking at in 30 years. Now for me, so I'm 57, um, I have long-term care insurance and I've had a policy for about 20 years. And so I look at this number and I would be in my 80s. I fully expect to be living at, at the time that this is gonna be what my care is gonna cost me. That number is crazy. Um, especially when you think about people that are going to their financial advisors and saying, okay, how much am I going to need? You know, if I live to be 90, what do I need? And your financial advisors is going to tell you, you need a couple million dollars. You've got to factor this into that calculation. Adult daycare right now is about 22,000 a year. So this is why I said adult daycare is such a great um, option for families, but it's kind of an option that people really don't know about. But look at this, $22,000 a year on average versus $73,000 a year. And $73,000 a year in your home, that represents, as I said, four to six hours of care in your home. This is eight hours a day outside of the home with programming. So it's a great deal right now. Assisted living facilities are, this I do believe again is a little bit low, but there are things called board and care facilities that take the cost down a little bit. And then there are communities like there's a community in La Jolla, um, for example, Monarch Cottage is one of, uh, it's like a boutique um, memory care facility and, and it's between 12 to $15,000 a month. And so between the two, 4,000 for a board and care facility, 4,500 up to 15,000 is what you could pay per month. On average, people will pay $63,000 a year to be in an assisted living facility. And keep this in mind, folks. A lot of our clients who have memory care issues, and I mean very serious issues whereby um, they would have to have 24-hour care at home. And if that were the case and you had to hire that, you're paying 600 bucks a day for that for an agency. So you go into an assisted living facility and just think about somebody who has a memory care issue. They're, they're in their room by themselves and maybe they fall and maybe they're not able to get to their call button. Maybe they're lonely. Maybe they just need some extra attention. A lot of our clients, families hire private nursing or private home care to go into these assisted living facilities. So in addition, to the rent that they're paying for their care and assisted living, they're also paying this. Just to have private people with that person because the family either has, the family members have to work and they don't feel as though their loved one is being um, spent enough time with, right? And that makes sense because assisted living facilities and memory care facilities, everybody's in their own space and there's only so much staff to go around. So. $63,000 a year is low for that type of care, but that's the average. And then again, you have nursing facility care. Nursing facility care is on average $117,000 a year. Who in the world would need to be in a skilled nursing facility um, and not be home or not be in assisted living? Those types of individuals would be someone who has had a profound stroke and needs to be on a feeding tube. Uh, because that cannot be managed in assisted living or someone who has um, severe wounds or someone who has needs to be on a ventilator or a breathing apparatus. So again, small percentage of people do need that. So long-term care insurance looks like this. It looks like a piggy bank. You put your annual premium into that piggy bank and that piggy bank is full from the first day that you pay your premium. So for example, let's say you bought a policy that is going to pay you $5,000 a month for three years, and you paid your first premium in May. That piggy bank would have a value of 200 to $250,000, boom, right away. So you have that piggy bank available that in the event that you need care, 
they will pay for you in your home in an assisted living facility or in a skilled nursing. So the point of these policies is this, because we don't have a crystal ball, we don't know what kind of care we're gonna need or where we're gonna need to be cared for. And also things are gonna change. Things are already changing in terms of how people get care. All you need to understand is there's basically four things about these policies that are important to know. How much are they gonna pay you per month what is that piggy bank worth? How much is in that piggy bank? How long do you have to wait before your benefits start? That's called a deductible. And do you have an inflation rider? Those four things, very simple. We try to keep it very simple for people to help them understand if you get a policy, you just look at those four things first. You can get kind of fancy with some benefits, but in general, what we want our clients to understand is you buy a policy, you got a piggy bank. So God forbid next year, you need to use that benefit. It's available for you. Um, now you might be like me and have a policy and pay that premium for 20 years and haven't used it. And that's annoying, but yet at the same time, I don't want to use it. And I'm happy that I have my piggy bank in case that I do need care. The other thing and this is kind of a, when you first look at this illustration, it's kind of a little messy and a little busy, but I like it. And here's why I like it. Because this, what I showed you earlier is called traditional long-term care. So if you look at long-term care insurance, you have two different paths you can go down. You can buy traditional long-term care and pay every year, pay as you go, or you can do what's called a hybrid policy. And a hybrid policy is just that. It's a combination of two things melted into one. The two things are this. It is a life insurance policy that will pay for long-term care. So think about a life insurance policy like this. Most life insurance you have, you die, a beneficiary gets that money. But in this case, you have a life insurance policy and you become disabled and you need long-term care this policy will use that death benefit that would have gone to your heirs and it will pay you for your care. So you can use that money for your care. And people say, well, why would I wanna do that? Well, here's why. With these types of policies, you pay one premium, like in a little bucket, you pay one premium and you're gonna get that money back in one way or the other. You can get your money back just by canceling the, the policy and say, you know what? I just won the lottery. I don't need long-term care anymore. I want my money back. Then you can get your money back um, with interest. This one over here, you aren't getting your money back. You pay that premium. That premium goes into that piggy bank. And if you never need long-term care, that piggy bank stays with the insurance company and you don't get anything. This one... You pay your premium, and if you change your mind, you get your money back. Or if you die, I should say if you die, when you die, um, you will have a death benefit that will be given to your beneficiaries. Somebody's going to get that money back, right? And usually, I'm just going to give an example. If you put $100,000 into this policy, your death benefit is going to be double. So your heirs will get two hundred grand. Or if you need long-term care, the bucket is bigger. And in the event that you need long-term care, they will pay for your long-term care benefits. And it's usually an amount of money that's three times, generally, the amount of your original deposit. People like this for that obvious reason, because they don't feel like it's such a crapshoot in that A, what if I never need long-term care and I've paid all this money out to my insurance company? I kind of like the thought of somebody's going to get something back. That's why people do this. That's why people like this. The downside to this type of a product is sometimes, not always, but sometimes when you combine two things together, you don't get the best of both worlds. You don't get the best of the long-term care coverage. It's going to be a little less. You don't get the best of the life insurance. It might be a little bit less. But if that's not your concern and your concern more is, I just want somebody to get this money back, then this is a product that you might want to take a look at. 
Um, so you can choose to look at these policies too. The other downside to it, it might not be a downside, but for some people it is, you have to put in a lot of money into this to make it work properly. And what I mean by that is if your long-term care insurance premium, this guy was going to be $3,000 a year, this one, you're going to have to put in a single premium deposit or a monthly premium or an annual premium. That's going to be probably triple that amount. Why? Because it's life insurance and you're older. And so, you know, it's more expensive and it's also doing two things instead of just one thing. So you have to commit to something like this with the understanding that it's a way that you're choosing to fund your long-term care insurance. It's not better, it's not worse, it's just an option. And when we talk to people, we just try and help them figure out which way is the better route for them to go. I said this earlier, and I'm gonna say it again. We try and make this as simple as we can for people. There's four things you have to decide when you look at long-term care insurance. And as a broker, what we do is we get your health and in, health information and we plug in four components to these different companies to shop for you. The first component we, we want to know is how much should we ask this insurance to pay for your care every month? And most people take $5,000 a month today. That's where people should start. You should generally shouldn't go any lower than that. So $5,000 a month is where most people start. That's where, what you're going to get. And then most people will buy a pool piggy bank value of between three, five years. But you kind of look at it as a dollar value because your piggy bank could last longer than that. It just depends on how you're using your money. But the starting value is going to be between two hundred dollars to $250,000. That's pretty common. The next thing is we're going to put an inflation rider on this. Most people will take a two or three percent inflation rider. We try and get people to take three percent if they can afford it, but two percent is is absolutely the lowest, and you should have a two percent compounded inflation rider because care is going up. Um, from what I've read, um, different websites and where I pulled the current uh, prices off. They said that the inflation right now is between 1.4 to 3%. So if you get a 2 or 3% inflation, you should be fine. And then the last thing is the deductible, what's also called the elimination period. The elimination period just means this. How long are you going to have to pay for your care before this thing starts kicking in? And if most people have a 90 day waiting period, most people. So here it is again in a little snapshot because I wanna give you some prices so that you'll see how much is something like that cost. This is traditional long-term care that you pay the premium every year. This is for a policy, let's say you bought this tomorrow. You're gonna get $5,000 a month for care in today's dollars and you want a $200,000 pool maximum. You put a 3% compounded and here's some of the prices. I wanna draw your attention to the difference between men, men and women. Males pay less, almost $1,000 less, a little more. Shocking, I know. I'm sure you all understand why. It's because women live longer, need care longer, need care sooner. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the usage of long-term care insurance is quite high for women. Age 60 is this, 65. Now, one of the things I want to tell you, look at age 70. Is that annually or month? That's annually. It's annually. Yeah. Now I want to draw your attention to this figure right here, 5,097. This is for a female at age 70. So that's just an eye popper, isn't it? And also age 75 is an eye popper, but I want you to look at it like this. I've been paying on my long-term care insurance premium since I was 37. So I've had it almost 20 years, 20 years or so. I've been paying in a lot over those years. 
So you can either choose to start early and pay a smaller amount for the rest of your life, or you can jump on the train later, get your ticket <laughs> and pay more. Um, but in general, you're not going to come out, you know, worse off than I am. It's just a matter of actually being able to get it. Um, going through underwriting and getting a policy at age 70 and 75 is pretty tough. Most insurance companies have about a 25 to a 30 percent declination rate. In other words, we can't insure people, you know, 25 to 30 percent. We can't help them. But in general, I don't necessarily want you to be scared away from those annual premiums. It is a lot. But if you're starting later and you can get something, hallelujah. I mean, what a great thing you can do for yourself that makes sense. Now, how do you get money out of this policy? I want to make sure I'm paying attention to the time. Um, as I said before, if at some point you need assistance with your activities of daily living, two of those things, either that you need somebody standing by or you need somebody physically putting their hands on you, then that means that you have need and you are not independent in that particular issue. As I said, the most common for claims to start is showering and dressing. Or, so it's one or the other, either functionally you need help or if you have a cognitive impairment as such that you need constant supervision. Um, then, and, and you have that documented and you have a diagnosis, then you can file a claim also for that. The reason I mentioned that is because uh, a lot of individuals early on in that process can care for themselves functionally. They um, can shower, et cetera. They can dress. It's just that they're not safe necessarily to be by themselves all the time. So uh, as I said, 70% of all claims are paid at home. The average claim is from three to five years. And understand you guys, that doesn't mean that you're laid out in a bed for three to five years. That just sounds horrific. Uh, we have clients that are quite active, but they're active because they have good in-home support people that are helping them stay active and be outside of their home when they want to. Um, so claims can last, you know, for quite a long time, especially dementia claims that can last for quite a long time. One of the things I would say, and I'm doing a program, I, I don't know if it, I think it might be in June. Um, the topic is I have long-term care insurance now, how should I use it or something like that? It's about the claims event when you should file a claim, the things to be aware of with long-term care claims, et cetera. What I will say is that most people wait too long to file a claim because they don't think that they're eligible. Um, and oftentimes it's because family members are really picking up the pieces and it's sort of like a hidden need because they have things being done for them and they don't think they need to file a claim. So we help people understand that. Now, who should have long-term care insurance? As I said at the beginning of the program, it isn't an either or, it's everybody, everybody has an opinion about this, honestly. And I find that most of our clients that end up purchasing long-term care insurance, they just have a gut feeling about it. They just feel that um, for them, they don't want to worry about it or they have a family issue going on. So let me give you an example. Single individuals um, are more at risk of being financially um, hamstrung because of long-term care. That's obvious. Uh, again, if you're married and your spouse is helping you and taking care of you, you're not hiring private care. But if you're a single individual, then that means you're going to have to, to pay for someone to do that. If you have limited family support from the perspective of, and this is super common, of course, family, adult children might be uh, geographic, but most oftentimes it's just the complexity of life is uh, so unfortunate. Um, I think that it has become very apparent um, because of the cost of living and whatnot that caring for loved ones becomes outsourced 
because um, kids, adult children, literally are barely making ends meet and they're trying to keep their jobs, whatnot. The first slide that I put, I think it had something on there about the cost of women who leave the workspace to care for an aging parent is just amazing. The other thing is leaving a legacy. Um, some individuals have family members that they want to or have to leave um, a legacy to because of, of they're infirmed or they need help or they're disabled, something like that, or because you just would prefer to leave your estate to someone as opposed to using it for your care. Medi-Cal, so people who should have long-term care insurance, is because Medi-Cal is not an option. And I would say for most people who have resources, meaning if you have um, anywhere north of four to 500,000 in savings and a home, Medi-Cal may not be an option for you immediately. And you should think about having long-term care insurance. Say that again, say, say that again. If you have north, in assets, meaning cash north of three to $500,000 and beyond, Medi-Cal may not be an option for you, especially if you're a single person, because in order to get Medi-Cal in California, you have to spend wow. all your resources. And if you have re resources, it's not a fun thing to do. The other thing is if you have a family history of dementia, you should be getting long-term care insurance or Parkinson's, something like that. Um, I have a question. Oh, yeah, is that the end of your presentation? Okay, because um, if you look at the numbers that you presented at um, 5,000 per month, let's just say yeah, for today, yeah. not with inflation, yeah, times 12, yeah. 12 months is 60,000 a year? If, if you buy a policy that will pay that, that is correct. If you did, and then the average is three to five years, that's $300,000 where the annual premium that you suggested, at least for my age, um, is, so 10. Let's go back. To that. So for, let me put this in. Oh yeah, so that premium is only 200,000, the pool max, where if, if I live five years, it would be 300,000. Because you said the average, uh, you know, um, long-term care is three to five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. so um, that's three hundred thousand a year, three hundred thousand dollars for five years, and this this policy is only two hundred is the, the pool max. So it it depends. You're you can choose more in a pool max. I picked this number because this is the average of three year. So the claim event goes from three to potentially five years. So I have to start somewhere to show premiums, but to use your example, I'm just gonna get a calculator. Let's say that you're 65, okay? And you're gonna pay $4,061 a year. And you're gonna pay that for 25 years. So you've paid in $100,000, right? Over 25 years. But over 25 years, that pool maximum has grown. It's gonna grow because you have a 3% compounded inflation rider. So this pool max by the- is that, is that, That's the policy, right? That's correct. the payout. That's right. right. So this payout is gonna keep growing and growing and your monthly maximum is gonna keep growing and growing and growing. At a but, but at that rate, you may as well just put it in savings. But that's that's my point. And Sandy, I'm so glad you're bringing this up because that's a mis that's a misunderstanding. If you put four thousand dollars in savings for 25 years, you're going to save hundred thousand dollars. That is true. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. right. But in 20 the policy is better. Better. Right. In 25 years, your policy maximum will be almost doubled. You'll be almost at $400,000. Well, how does that work then? I don't get it. I, I don't get the policy max, the pool max. What, so the pool, then, the pool, that's your policy. Right, so the pool maximum, this is what you start with. Do you remember this piggy bank example? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So you're going to put in your $4,000 a year in there. Mm -hmm. Your piggy bank is going to start being worth $200,000, but every year that guy's going to get fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter because you have what's called an inflation rider that's a guaranteeing that this piggy bank is going to keep grow, 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 grow. So that's 3% annually? It yes. Grows? Yeah. yeah. Now, let me posit this to you. Let's say you need care 10 years from now, okay? And you've put in $4,000 times 10 years, you've put in 40,000. You're still getting that full piggy bank. If you would have saved $4,000 a year, you wouldn't be able to save enough because you had a healthcare event too early. So you can save money if you start really, really young for long-term care, but it's got to be in a separate, a separate thing, separate from your regular. Yeah. Well, the, 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 then the rider, the inflation rider is absolutely mandatory, really. Exactly. That's what I was saying, because that piggy bank is going to get fatter and fatter and grow and grow and grow. But yet, you know, you're going to be paying your premium and um, your benefit, your policy, if you want to look at it as a savings account, if you would like to look at it that way. For your $4,000 a year, for example, you're saving $4,000 a year, but in this little account, this little piggy bank, this thing is growing and it's starting out at $200,000. So you put 4,000 bucks in and that thing is automatically already at boom, $200,000. That's what you have available. God forbid something happened to you sooner than later. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm just, I'm just trying to decide because I have savings and I have, you know, savings that just sits there. So I'm trying to decide if that's enough and, yeah, you know, yeah. but I'm, I'm, um, I don't have long-term care right now and I'm 72. Okay. So, okay. um, I have talked to other brokers and, you know, what they had to offer wasn't very nice, <laughs> but you might want to consider the combination and I, I mean, you but and that I was talk, so expensive. It is. You and I can talk talk offline, but I, I just want to say this one thing. If you you just said to me that you have your little savings account for long term care, yeah. why would you not put that little savings account into a ve vehicle that's going to exponentially yeah. grow? Yeah, it's I hear you. Thing. You're just repositioning it into a different. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah I hear you. It's an investment. This is definitely an investment. This right here. Yeah. Um, okay. I have, I have a question that says, will I be discussing the CalPERS rate increase? Um, I have extensively spoken about CalPERS. Um, I should probably keep that up there for my contact information. I have spoken about CalPERS so much. And what I would say to you is that if you have a question about your personal CalPERS, you're, you're welcome to email me. I do consultations for half hour chunks. What um, is CalPERS? If you don't know, you don't need to know. It's, it's a <laughs> long-term care policy that you don't have. Um, so regarding if you have a CalPERS policy, if you have a rate increase, I, I would prefer to talk to you as opposed to telling you what to do. Um, in general, I tell people to pay the darn increase, um, but at the same time, I do realize that it is um, difficult for people, um, but that's why I'm saying, you know, I need to talk to you. I can't give recommendations without knowing what you have. And if you'll allow me to jump in, Linda, yeah. um, our members, everybody can find your CalPERS presentation, which is really excellent on our YouTube channel. So you can go back there and watch that if you are interested. Okay, sounds good. And by the way, Howard, you have my email. I'm gonna type my email in here really quick. You can send to me that information you got with CalPERS, your, um, the letter, and it's showing you the options. You can just send that to me in an email. 
and I'll be able to vet, vet that out for you. JCLTCA.com. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? No, that was good. Thank you. You're welcome. I have all your info too. I'll yeah. get, get in touch with you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Sandy. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. So did you, you're, you're wrapped up there. You're open now. If there are any questions from our members, members, yep. do you have any, this is a, a wonderful opportunity if you have a specific question. So feel free to either raise your hand or speak up. Okay, it looks like you uh, addressed everything. <laughs> Linda, that was really comprehensive. So, so helpful. Thank you very much. Of course, with your permission, we will be posting this on our YouTube channel. And uh, we really appreciate uh, everything you do. Well,